Hello everybody, my name is Deb Sabaris and I'm the CEO for the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. Lovely to have you all out there today uh, listening to this really important webinar. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land. I'm here in the city actually today. I'm on the land of the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge Elders past and present, emerging Aboriginal Elders and Elders from other cultures. So I'm now going to introduce uh, this fantastic webinar. Today's webinar, The Journey from Response to Recovery from COVID-19 for Victoria's Community Health and Human Services sector is part of the Tri-Peaks webinar series. And I'm hoping that um, those that are on this meeting today have enjoyed some of those that we have put on offer for you during, um, during this time. Um, the Tri-Peaks is a collaboration by the Centre, the Victorian Healthcare Association and the Victoria, Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association. So I acknowledge, acknowledge both Tom and Sam for our wonderful work together. It is really important that peak bodies uh, do this type of work, particularly at a time um, as that that we're in. This work is to support good governance and integrated practices across ch children and families, alcohol and other drug and community health sectors. And we are often finding we have more in common than the differences. So I hope that Tom and Sam are here today. Just in terms of a bit of housekeeping, many of you are now used to this technology, but we'll just go over a couple of things. This webinar is being recorded and will be available with today's slides on, on the centres, uh, the VHA and VADA's uh, web pages under the Tri Peaks project web page but normally we get this information out to you very quickly, um, almost immediately after the session. Our speakers are keen to have an interactive webinar, so please utilise the Q&A and chat functions during the webinar when you have questions or comments, and we will endeavour to get to them um, towards the end of the session. Hopefully we'll have time. Normally we don't have a lot of time, but hopefully we will today. So, and, and I also want to acknowledge Paul McDonald, who's here on, um, on this meeting, uh, the chair of the centre's board, who highly recommended uh, the CUBE guys to come and talk to us all today. So thank you to him um, for helping make that happen. So now to introduce our speakers who are with us today. Um, so um, they're really from CUBE Consulting and actually they have done some work with the centre in the past. They're a purpose-driven consultancy working across uh, working solely with public value organisations across government and non-government sectors. Um, they are Tom Craven and Rob Cam from CUBE. So Tom Crack Carvin is a director at CUBE, CUBE Group, is an economist and strategy consultant. Tom's work focuses on the delivery of public, serv of public services. He helps health, justice, education and social services organisations to understand the major economic, social and policy trends impacting their businesses and to chart a course through them and um, really um, having those skills um, available to us at the moment are really important. Prior to consulting, Tom held senior leadership positions in the Departments of Health and Human Services and the Department of Premier and Cabinet and so he's probably quite well known to many of you. Um, Rob Cam is a partner at CUBE Group also. He's a lead strategic advisor of the Victoria's public healthcare system and runs CUBE's health, health sector practice. Rob has over 25 years of experience working with public and private health services, including strategic roles in project management, business analysis and financial management. Rob is currently working with a number of Victorian health services uh, uh, to develop strategies and plans to immediate to the immediate challenges of the current environment, as well as long lasting health systems. And we know that um, this is a very complex environment we're in. So, by way of introducing the webinar today and what you should expect, today's webinar will cover what Australia's possible pathways to recovery from COVID-19 look like for health and community services. The multiple waves of service disruptions that COVID-19 will cause, and here in Victoria we know that oh so well in the last couple of weeks, and how other organisations are preparing for the long-term journey to recovery. I'd like now to hand over to Tom and Rob, Rob, sorry, to uh, present to us today. So welcome to both of you. 
Thank you, Deb. So, thank you so much. And thank you for the, those kind words. And, and thank you for letting us be a part of that. Um, uh, I'd like to also start to add my acknowledgement of the, uh, to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, uh, present and future as well. Um, and also just wanted to acknowledge um, this forum. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. I'm sure many of you, if you're like me, you are drowning in the information and news and updates about COVID-19 and what it means for our activities and organisations, um, an opportunity like this to come together um, to share and to make sense of what's going on and also to plan our contribution in, a, in our own way to Victoria's response and recovery is a fantastic thing to do. So we're, we're really grateful to be a part of it. So, so thank you for having us. Um, the title of this presentation is, is that of a report that we published about a month ago, a little over a month ago. And, and at that time, new COVID-19 cases were falling sharply and the, um, the sense of crisis was beginning to subside. Our, our message at the time in that report was that the job was not done, um, a message that felt a fair bit more relevant at that moment than it might feel today. Um, that report um, gave the message that um, COVID-19 was no longer just a health crisis, um, but actually had become a national uh, disaster, a, well, a global disaster. And it was also, or was, or was soon to be a social and economic crisis as well. Um, so the report that we've produced argued that Victorian public services faced not one wave of crisis and disruption, but four, or at least four. Um, and that these waves would be with us for months and years, not weeks, as, as we might have hoped at that point in time. These four waves are there on the slide that we, that we, and we'll unpack them over the course of this conversation. Um, the report also stressed that organisations can't persist in a state of crisis um, or complete uncertainty for that long. Um, with a timescale of disruption looking like months and years, we need to start creating resilient organisations and systems now that can sustain and thrive over the long term of this crisis. And to do that, we need to do that not just only for our own sake, but also for the sake, especially, obviously, for the people who are going to so desperately need our services over the next little while. Um, now, if they say a week is a long time in football or in politics or whichever sport you prefer, then um, a month is certainly a long time in COVID-19. Um, thankfully for this presentation and for our report, uh, the past month and, and especially the past week or so in Victoria, is demonstrating more and more the size and the scale and the longevity of these waves, um, which we hope makes this discussion even more timely today as it was a month ago. Um, so what do we wanna do for the next 40 minutes or so, we hope, um, as long as I can speak quickly enough, is cover a couple of things. Firstly, um, we wanna talk about where we are today and, and what we think we know about the scale and timing of these challenges that we're presenting for you. And secondly, we, we're going to cover where we think we might be headed, unpacking a bit about what each of these ways might mean and some of the ways in which you and your colleagues are already starting to prepare for them and address them. Um, now, I'm an economist, as, as Deb mentioned, by training, um, and during an economic downturn, every economist is a Keynesian. Um, John Maynard Keynes famously said, it is better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Uh, which is pretty good advice for this moment, I think, given how fast moving everything everything is. So you, you, won't, you won't hear any confident um, pronouncements from us, but hopefully what you will get is a compelling picture of what the road ahead might look like um, and what it might mean for you. Um, so that's where we're headed, but perhaps before we get into that, I might briefly introduce Rob. Um, Rob, as uh, Deb's given Rob's quick introduction, um, Rob's going to be a sort of uh, discussant, I suppose, throughout the presentation, cutting me off at, at key points to capture your comments, questions, or anything else. So, Rob, why don't you um, do a quick sound check and, and possibly also just talk about how the questions and comments might might work. Yeah, thank you, Tom, and uh, hi, everybody, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to, to join in this conversation today. Yeah, as Tom said, um, I'll be cutting in at sort of key points in in the in the presentation to to reflect on some of the, the key points that that will be, that, that we'll cover throughout the the conversation. And uh, my job will be to sort of keep a track of the 
the chat feed and the Q and A's, and and if if possible, we can feed those through. And definitely, as Deb said, we've, we'll we'll try and make sure we've got some time at the end to to deal with those questions. The other thing that um, you might wish to do um, as participants is is actually share some of your experiences through the chat as well, which um, I think that would be helpful in terms of um, you know responding to some of the things that we're presenting and 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 add, add some extra extra discussion that we can that we can weave into the the, the webinar as we go through. Um, um, over back to you, Tom. Thanks. So please, by all means, share your thoughts and questions and we'll get to as many of them as we have time for. Um, so where are we, where are we now? Um, in short, our view is we are in a very fortunate position of having a health crisis where the treatment is doing more damage than the disease. I want to highlight the thankfulness of, of that position, but that, the position that we are in. Um, to talk about where we are, we, we really need to start with where we came from. And if we can cast our mind back um, only a couple of months ago when everyone uh, became very interested in parabolic curves and, and flattening them. Of course, flattening the curve has become um, a, a very effective and, and viral public health communication, something perhaps like we've never seen. Um, it's become memes and newsreels and social media posts flatten the curve, keeping the spread of the virus as low as possible and keeping it within, importantly, within the capacity of our health system. That, that was our goal, that, that is our stated goal. That's the goal of the World Health Organization, it's the goal of societies around the world. And, and as of um, even a month ago and, and in the last few weeks, that is the stated goal of the Australian community and the Australian governments as well. So it's worth, um, even in the context of the last week, recognising how we're going with flattening the curve. And of course, we're doing very, very, very well. Um, this chart here is, um, uh, is the uh, is a graph of COVID-19 patients in ICU. It includes the peak of those cases at 93 in ICU on the 7th of April. Our curve, as you can see, is is so flat you can barely see it. Um, now, of course, that's not to say that there isn't. Of course, there is potential for exponential growth, and it still exists. Um, but the the extent to which we've flattened this curve, and the extent to which we've developed our public health response, partly is represented by the growing ICU capacity that's represented there. Um, but all our, also our ability to test and to trace. Um, the, our success in, in doing that has meant that um, the, the likelihood of us experiencing the type of overwhelming demand on our health system that we were worried about, and that of course we saw in North America and parts of Europe, um, it must be said that that is now pretty unlikely, which is an extraordinary public health achievement, even in the midst of what we're experiencing over the last week or so. Um, make no mistake, um, that public health response has been an undoubted success and positive thing for Australia. Whichever way you count it, our achievements has saved a lot of lives. Um, this table here on your screen just lists a few um, expert es estimates that I'm aware of, um, ranging from um, early estimates of up to 50 to 100, 150,000 lives through to more recent comparisons. Some of those earlier comparisons, as you know, have, have come under some um, questions and scrutiny in sure. But nevertheless, if, if we take even the most conservative of estimates, um, some of those, this, some of those smaller estimates, we're still talking about saving lives in the order of 10 times Australia's annual road toll, or the equivalent of having a year without lung cancer, or having four years without influenza, or um, something that's equivalent to something like two and a half to three times um, the amount of Australians who suicide every year. Um, it's a remarkable achievement and one, one we, ought to, we ought to be aware of and be proud of, even in the midst of ongoing, ongoing challenges. We're also, of course, seeing other positive health, health outcomes from the COVID response as well. This graph here is from the Commonwealth Government's flu tracker. It tracks, um, it tracks laboratory confirmed cases of influenza over the year. Um, each year, influenza, can, uh, influenza is responsible for an average of somewhere 1,500 to 3,000 deaths, something like 300,000 visits to the GP each year, and of course, something like 18,000 hospitalisations. Um, I'm sure there are people on this call who are much more able than me to talk about the strain that seasonal that, that flu season places on emergency departments. Um, 2019, as you can see there, was a, was a shocker and placed great strain on our emergency departments, on our, on our public health system and its capacity. There's been a few other bad years in recent times that have created enormous challenges. 2020, the uh, dark orange line there on the graph is not going to be one of those years. In fact, 
uh, a quote uh, last week, the, the Australian Medical Association, South Australian President, uh, Dr. Chris Moy was quoted last week as saying, COVID-19 may have up until this point saved more people than it's killed. Quite extraordinary for a global pandemic. Fatalities on our roads are down by about 25% compared to last year, no doubt due to the uh, reduced traffic there. Um, we have some provisional data of overall rates of death in Australia that released recently. It's, it's early and we'll know more as things come through, but Australia is broadly on track with our rate of mortality that um, we would expect um, and haven't seen anything like the excess deaths of our, of our friends overseas. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is of course that this achievement has come at an enormous cost. And I want to spend a bit of time talking to you through the, a picture of what that's looking like, the magnitude of which we're still yet to get a clear picture of. Some of you are aware the first economic news related to COVID-19 came out in March, but that was, um, that was quarterly data and, and really the COVID had only really hit towards the end of that quarter in March. So we only saw, saw blips. More recent data for May has provided the first real measure of what Australians are facing for their economic future. And it's pretty, it's pretty grim. The chart on the left is Australia's unemployment rate. Male un unemployment amongst men rose by 50% in just a quarter. And for women, it was a third. Australia's unemployment rate is now over 7%. We haven't had an unemployment rate that high for 20 years. That's a quarter of a million more unemployed people than there were just a month ago. Of course, for those of you who know these statistics, unemployment is only part of the story. For one, we are still in the presence of the JobKeeper program introduced by the Australian government. Something like 40% of Australian businesses have signed up for JobKeeper and it's supporting something like 4.7 million workers, which is something like 40% uh, of the total workforce. These are people who are still working and whose um, businesses have fallen, had revenue fallen by at least 30% pretty much overnight. So they're not in our unemployment statistics but they are working in roles that um, the viability of which is, is, is a significant risk. Uh, the un unemployment rate for many of you will know only counts those people who are in the workforce, i.e. actively looking for work. Um, those who stop looking for work and who leave the workforce are not counted. Hence the a chart like the one on the right, which tracks monthly hours worked per capita in Australia, gives an even greater sense of the reduction in employment, down by around 11% in, in just a month. Underemployment um, for many people is as significant and as unemployment, and particularly at a time like this where um, government stimulus packages are supporting a lot of, of, the, uh, of businesses. Um, this graph here charts uh, un un underemployment, people who are currently employed but wish to work more hours but are unable to. In addition to the 900,000 people or so who are unemployed, as of this month, there are now 1.8 million who, while employed, aren't working the level of hours that they, that they want. That's a 50% increase in the last month. That means that about 14% of Australia's working, out, working age population are now either unemployed or working for fewer hours than they wish. Of course, uh, along with the shutdown is an impact on overall economic output. Victoria's, uh, sorry, Australia's record run without a recession eff effectively officially ended this quarter. And, and what you're seeing here is OECD forecasts for Australia's GDP over the course of 2020. They estimate somewhere between 5.4 and 6.3% reduction in our overall um, GDP for the year. Now, economists like me, we use decimal points to show that we have a sense of humour and to make weather forecasters look good. Um, so remembering my quote of Keynes being roughly right and not precisely wrong, the point here is not the 6.4 or the 5.3 or, or whatever, the point is it's large, very large. So the scale of this reduction in economic output is something like 95 to $120 billion, which is something like $3,800 to $4,800 for every Australian person. You can see here that Australia compares relatively favourably to a lot of other countries. That's actually cold comfort for us, really. For those of you who remember the 2008 financial crisis, it was China's rebound that, among other things, fueled ours. Um, we can't rely on our trading partners this time around. Um, it's probably also to note that, uh, important to note that these projections uh, of Australia's favourable forecast is partly because of our successful containment efforts and also because of our relatively low public debt. 
there are other areas where Australia's economic situation is a little bit more fragile, particularly our levels of household debt. Many of you will have heard Australia has the highest rates of household debt in the world. On average, household debt is twice household average incomes. And our reliance on property prices to maintain these levels of debt is pretty widely recognised. Simply put, at this time, um, there are many, many families who are not able to go long periods of time with reduced or unemployment. The other key message is that the economic downturn is not being is not shared equally. In particular, the, the story of the last month was the impact on young people. Young people aged uh, 15 to 24 lost 3, 000, uh, more than 300,000 jobs since March. That's 41% of all job losses were people aged 15 to 34. As you can see from this graph here, um, the unemployment rate amongst young people is now two and a half that times that of all adults. Um, and of course, many young people are taking, uh, in fact, leaving the workforce and no longer actively looking for work. If we counted everyone who left the workforce in, in, in the latest data, one in four young people would be out of work. This means that the true in unemployment rate um, is much higher, which would, in, including all those who've given up searching for work, is much higher than the 16% that you can see on the graph there. Young people are particularly hit hard in this, in, in this period. Um, the downturn is also not equally shared amongst, amongst sectors, and, and these, these two charts give a sense of that. So the one on the left is the proportion of businesses who's, who've, seen a who've reported a change in their revenue compared to this time last year. The green, all of the green, means businesses that have reported a reduction in revenue, and the darker the green, the greater the fall in revenue. It only takes a quick visual to see that the vast majority of businesses in the Australian economy have seen significant reductions in their revenue over the last quarter compared to this time last year. Accommodation and food services, obviously the, mo the, the most significantly affected and the scale of it is, is something quite significant. More over 60% of businesses report 50% drops in their revenue compared to this time last year. These are not typically large businesses with large capital balances. Um, many of them are small businesses with small uh, the right hand side uh, gives, the uh, gives the decreases employment in each sector also over the, uh, also in May. Accommodation and food again is right there out in front, almost 300,000 people losing their jobs in the May, in May. Uh, sorry, in the quarter to, to May. Um, it's worth remembering these are numbers while JobKeeper is still in place. The other unfortunate thing about um, the other bad news about what uh, about the sectoral impact that we're looking at too is those sectors where job loss has been the highest have certain um, reasons why um, we don't want them to be the hardest hit. In particular, they have high rates of casual and, un and unstable employment, they have high rates of young people, they often have higher representation of women, and of course, many of them are also have uh, lower skilled employees. While we're on this slide, I can't help but just very quickly point out where construction is. Um, you can find it. Um, about three quarters of the way down there. Construction industry is not one of the hardest hit sectors. Of course, that's, that's not to say that construction businesses aren't nervous right now, of course, of course they are. Um, but, um, and this, this might be the only critical thing I say about government decision-making so far, um, our obsession with building things and building our way out of recovery, out of recessions needs to be rethought. These sectors are not the most, most impacted sectors and they're not the places most readily able, able to redeploy food or accommodation, retail, education sectors, employees that are losing jobs in great numbers. Now, just in case um, that's a lot of doom and gloom and, and it is, it's worth remembering we did make the right choice. Um, the graph here that you're looking at is um, actual data, not projections from the OECD, but this is actual data for the first quarter of the year. Um, again, COVID only really started hitting in, in March, so this, these have minimised the impact on this data a little bit. But what you can see is uh, sharp economic downturns across all of our um, uh, peer countries. Um, the key point here is that many countries that shut down their economies much more slowly and a much more limited way than we did are still seeing large decreases in economic activity. Sweden is there, we, we don't gen, tend to compare ourselves with Sweden, but Sweden, many of you will know, has taken a, a quite a different approach to managing COVID and left a lot of their economy quite open. 
Um, for this data, it seems that they've, uh, their economy is holding up in the short term. I think we'll learn more about that as we go. I'm certainly aware of some economic data suggesting that activity, even in Sweden, is, is slowing down considerably. Um, for us, the key point is Australia did not have a choice about whether we'd enter a recession. Uh, all, all parts of the world are suffering this. The only thing we had to choose was the terms on which we entered it, and we undoubtedly made the right choice. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see economic, uh, economic analysis done by the University of New South Wales and of Melbourne, which tried to estimate some of the benefits. Um, it's something like $1.1 trillion from a, the benefits of, a, of, our, of our restrictions compared to a cost excuse me, they're about 90 billion. Now, many people could quibble about their methodology and they are estimating, uh, they are comparing the, the lockdown to a worst case scenario. But if you have their benefits, have them again, have them a third time, uh, we're still well in front. Australia absolutely made the right choice. Um, the reason I want to raise this economic modelling, though, at this stage, is just to point out that most of the sort of most of the economic modelling you'll see has a couple of core assumptions underneath it. In particular, how many of Australians, how many Australians are likely to contract the virus, and what that fatality rate is expected to be. In this modelling, which showed really strong economic, and strong benefits, and strong rationale for strict lockdowns, we're assuming a high, uh, quite a worst case scenario, high rates of Australians contracting the virus and a fatality rate that's also pretty high. As these two assumptions begin to change, so does the cost benefit equation. And so we'll come, to back, come back to that later in the conversation. There are signs of hope. Um, I won't labor these too much, but on the left-hand side, you'll see retail turnover. On the right-hand side, job advertisements on seek.com. Um, these are generally seen as lead indicators suggesting where economic activity is going. And some of them are possibly suggesting signs of hope uh, that possibly stimulus payments or whatever has recovered some confidence of, of people. Um, while you look at this one, spare a thought for your local grocer trying to keep um, his or her shelves appropriately stocked, not too much, not too little, in the context of panic buying leading to a sharp drop, leading to some sort of recovery. Um, spare a thought, spare a thought for that job. A lot of this story around the fallout of the, the wider social economic crisis of, the, of COVID-19 depends on the shape of the recovery. Now remember Keynes, I, I'm, I'm, I wanna be broadly right, not precisely wrong. I'm not gonna make any attempt to predict much of anything here. Um, this is a chart uh, from, which is the view of the OECD. It suggests um, what you might hear referred to as a V-shaped recovery. That is a relatively quick recovery. Um, it suggests that with only a single wave worldwide of the uh, of the virus, Australia could be back to its normal level of economic output within a year to 18 months. Um, that is of course possible and, and it's certainly what we might hope for. Um, I think what I want to communicate to you now though is that if that does happen that would be historically unprecedented and feels to me uh, pretty unlikely. Historically speaking, Australia doesn't have a whole lot of recessions to look back on and learn from. Um, we had to go back to um, the year of my birth, 1982, for, um, for a recession, and then the year that I entered grade four in 1991. Uh, I do not have any firsthand experience of recessions uh, worth sharing. Um, what I can tell you though, is that the recovery from these recessions tends not to be anything near as quick as those optimistic projections on the previous slide. As you can see, this, this chart in the orange tracks uh, levels of employment uh, as an index and, and the green line tracks hours of work. You can see that it takes many years for uh, those levels of employment to recover to their previous norm. In 1991, the recession took four and a half years to reach back to um, pre-normal um, levels of employment prior to the crisis. Um, actually, in reality, um, uh, when you consider the peak level of employment prior to the 1991 recession, it took us 10 years to get back to that level. Nine years, I have, excuse me. Um, to get more recent experience with recessions, we need to look overseas and, and the chart, you, the, the um, picture on your slide here is some research from some Harvard economists at, at the most, um, the most uh, significant financial crisis of the last sort of 50 or 70 years. Um, the key message of all of them is they take a long time, an average of there in about five years to recover. Um, this work was, was famous around um, shortly after the GFC where people were trying to work out how long the US would take to recover 
uh, its level of employment after the global financial crisis. We now know the answer to that question. It took six years for Victoria to recover, uh, sorry, for the United States to recover the level of employment it had prior to the, to the global financial crisis. In Europe, that time frame was 11 years, 11 years. So for those of you who might be playing along at home, global financial crisis was 2008, 11 years is 2019. Europe had one year of normal economic growth after the global financial, sorry, normal uh, levels of employment prior to COVID. Long-term unemployment is a, a big challenge. It's something that uh, many of you on this call will know much more about than me. Um, what we do know is that for people who are out of work for more than a year, are much more likely to stay unemployed than those who are out of work for a short period of time. In fact, I believe um, data from the Commonwealth tells us that long-term long unemployed people are more, almost twice as likely to remain unemployed than those more recently to lose their job. Many of the people um, in the 1991 recession um, never worked again. Long-term recessions uh, not only uh, take a long time, they also, take the, they also change the shape of our workforce and our economy. To put these graphs simply, um, after a recession, the same people do not return to the same jobs on the same terms. Um, to give a bit of data behind that, these, these two charts show on the left-hand side, full-time and part-time employment, on the right-hand side, monthly, uh, um, monthly hours worked by sex. Um, the darker orange line on the left-hand side is full-time employment. And you can see the small dips there around the two recessions. Levels of full-time employment never recovered from uh, either the 82 or the 91 recession. Now they were already on downward trends and have been obviously for, for decades, but those trends um, were pushed along and, and levels of full-time employment have never recovered, being replaced by part-time employment. Likewise, um, on the right-hand side, hours worked by men has also been declining for several decades, but again, the recession uh, pushed those along to levels that never recovered. Employment um, has been made up by, by increasing um, women's participation. Um, I'll pause shortly for, uh, for any comments from, from Rob, but one final point before I do, perhaps to finish, on, to finish this section on a slightly upward note. And that note of hope is that um, Australian governments of both persuasions are well aware of the need to promote and stimulate the economy. Um, you may recall in 2008, Kevin Rudd was praised for the success of his stimulus package as Australia avoided a, um, a recession during the GFC. That stimulus package was worth something like $50 billion. The one announced by the Commonwealth Government lately is four times that size. Um, the Commonwealth Government has committed something like $190 billion of stimulus, which equates to something like 40% of annual um, government, Commonwealth Government spending. Um, that's more than government spend on health, that's more than uh, the Commonwealth Government spend on education, defence, transport, police combined. Um, it equates to something like $7,600 per Australian person compared to uh, 2,900 per person during the GFC. It's considerable investment of money. Likewise, the Victorian government, uh, many of you will heard and see regular announcements coming from them. This year, they've put aside uh, $24.5 billion for emergency COVID response funding. That's about a third of annual Victorian government and an additional third of Victorian government expenditure. They've announced almost $2 billion investment in the healthcare system, $1.7 billion economic um, job package, and there will be more to come. I might pause there, hopefully, having convinced you of uh, a couple of things. Firstly, our goal of flattening the curve has, has um, and keeping the pandemic within the, our health system capacity has in all likelihood been achieved. That's a very positive thing. But the cost benefit equation of, of suppressing the violence does change from here and create some really difficult decisions for government. Uh, the second thing is that Australia has moved into the social and economic crisis. Um, and that will be with us in all likelihood for some time. Uh, the third point of hope is that Australian governments are investing in recovery and creating opportunities for us um, in the face of these significant challenges. Rob, any, um, any, anything to, to pause on there before I move on? Yeah, no, thanks, Tom. I think that's um, given a really good um, snapshot of where we're at now. And um, I think the important thing for us is to, to note that Look, a lot of hard work and, and a lot of pain has gone into making sure that we're well prepared from a from a health perspective to, re to respond to this challenge. And um, despite the sort of hiccups we've experienced, particularly in Victoria of recent times, we are, we are still well prepared to actually meet that challenge. However, as you've really well articulated, Tom, 
the, there's some flow on impacts and um, yeah, it, whilst we're all in this together, some of some parts of the economy uh, are going to feel this more than others, others and, and, and the, the, the pinch points will be much harder and certainly for a lot of the organisations dialing in today, you will be, you'll be starting to feel um, that pressure in terms of those flow and impacts and you know, we've had a few comments in the chat about um, you know, what's the flow and impact in terms of suicide and people delaying care? Um, how does it flow out in terms of mental health care? And, and hopefully, um, you know, it's timely that we, we are experiencing this and seeing, seeing how this is playing out, particularly with the Mental Health Royal Commission. And I think there's a really good opportunity for the experiences that we're having to date to actually flow into those recommendations. But um, I, I think we've got some good questions coming through and, and we've got and some of the, the questions coming through will, will I think the, the next session, the next part of your presentation, Tom, will, will probably help answer some of those questions. So over to you in terms of what next from here. Yeah, thank you. Well, th and thanks for those for, the, for, for those comments. Please send them through. Those questions are uh, thankfully wonderful segues for where we're about to go next. Um, so, so we're next, r reminding you that we're channeling um, Keynes again here, broadly right, not, pre not precisely wrong. Um, in, in broad terms, we think there are four waves of disruption and, and crisis that's facing public, public services and organisations like yourself flying from the pandemic. They start with the challenge of responding to the immediate crisis itself, um, either those of you in the healthcare system um, immediately responding to COVID-19 or, um, or to the rest of you who are maintaining essential services during a difficult period of um, restrictions. The second wave um, comes from what we see as being an unprecedented backlog of services and wait lists that will inevitably flow from the three to four months of shutdown that a lot of us have experienced. A third um, wave that we want to that we want to um, put on the horizon is a rising tide of complexity and, compl and complications, as opportunities for early intervention and for ongoing treatment and care have been missed during this period. And a couple of the questions in the comment, a uh, couple of the comments in the chat have made reference to that. And finally, the fourth that we want, we want, we want to put on your horizon is an extended fallout from the social and economic damage that I just described in the first half of this presentation. So let's quickly talk about each of those. We might, we might pause um, as we go. Um, several weeks ago, um, when we released the report, we suggested uh, a chart something like this to say there are four possible trajectories that COVID-19 might take uh, in Australia. At the time, again a month ago, our goal was to remind everyone that elimination of COVID-19 was not Australia's stated goal. Um, so far, conversations have tended to swing between two extremes. On the one hand, that we might eliminate um, COVID-19, which would be wonderful, like our, our New Zealand cousins appear close to have or close to, or we might have a catastrophic second wave, something like we might be seeing in the United States at the moment. However, in our view, uh, back then and, and also today, um, the other two, um, the other two um, trajectories have always seemed more likely. Australia's stated goal remains suppression, not elimination. And as cases remain low, um, questions begin to be raised clearly about the, the costs and benefits of uh, whether the benefits of elimination really outweigh its costs. Um, also, our, our government and our political will and, our, and the capacity that we've developed appears to be strong enough to prevent um, something like a second wave um, of the magnitude that we might have feared. Now, no one needs to be told uh, after the last week how difficult um, elimination of COVID-19 is proving to be. The last week or so in Victoria has seen more than a week of double digit uh, new cases and escalating rates. Um, local transmission now accounting for something like 80% of cases in Victoria um, compared to just 20% in New South Wales and, and a much lower percentage over the, the course of the, of the crisis so far. A couple of observations about the last week or so. The first is to say um, the peak we're experiencing is different in, in some ways as, as um, the peaks are beginning to be locational, at least for now. Uh, all but seven LGAs in Victoria have had a case of COVID-19 since, since the pandemic began. Um, but now, even despite the last week, still two thirds of Victoria's LGAs do not have an active case. Importantly, um, those areas where we're experiencing outbreaks today, and particularly in, in Melbourne's north, um, those areas are not the same as the largest with the overall counts of confirmed cases. So for example, uh, Banyul has, uh, I believe, the fifth highest over, overall number of COVID cases, but 
has, um, when I checked last night, no active cases in this current outbreak. Um, the City of Melbourne has 105 cases, but currently has just nine. Um, by contrast, Mooney Valley's 24 cases are a third of all cases, it, that, sorry, Mooney Valley's 24 active cases are a third of all cases in, in Mooney Valley. This regional nature of the outbreak um, is, is certainly um, consistent with what, what we're expecting. Um, also, we say um, today when I refreshed the DHS's corona data. Um, the second difference is, of course, our capacity to respond. And this is a chart from the ABC's wonderful uh, COVID update um, website. They, they deserve some credit for their efforts here. Um, it shows th this graph here that you're looking at, the, um, the blue line is the seven day average of new cases of, of COVID-19. The yellow line is seven day averages of testing, and this is in Victoria. As you can see, the, our two peaks there, the one on the left, as you can see, was at a time where we were testing um, thereabouts 2,000 um, people per day. Um, at the moment, we're testing 18,000 people per day. That's a, um, that, a further testament to our ability to flatten the curve and how, what that's created in terms of our health system having a capacity to respond. Um, now, again, we're not going to be too confident about what this might mean. We're going to learn a lot more over the next little while about how powerful our testing and tracing capability is to become. I, for one, am I'm, I'm, I'm confident that what we're seeing today is not the same existential challenge to our health system that the previous peak might have been. So what does all that mean for, for us, for, for you or, uh, as leaders of, of public um, service organisations? Well, these four broad trajectories that we've got here are still, um, the, the, the are still valid, but by far the most likely are the middle two, that we'll be seeing discrete outbreaks followed by a significant public health response to um, clamp them down, or alternatively, an ongoing flattened curve, excuse me, a flattened to a curve of transmissions. Remembering elimination at this stage is not the stated goal of Australian or Victorian governments. Outbreaks like we're seeing in, in uh, Melbourne's north at the moment, while they're not part of the su suppression plan by any means, they are certainly consistent with not pursuing elimination. Um, they're not expected, but they may, they're not unexpected rather, and they may very well continue into the future. We think this means two things for you and your organisations. Ongoing uncertainty and ongoing un restrictions on, um, on your ordinary business, working from home, physical distancing. Um, these things, this uncertainty, these ongoing restrictions are going to be with us for periods of months, not weeks. Um, now, Keynes, who I've quoted several times, might roll over in his grave if he thought I was predicting how this might end. So please don't um, think I'm overstating this. Um, what I've got on this graph here is what some possible end game scenarios are. And the purpose of them is to just emphasize my point that we're going to be at a period of time with of uncertainty um, and ongoing restrictions is going to be with us for some time. Obviously, a vaccine or, or cure is the goal, and many of our brightest minds are working hard on it. Um, the time frame of 12 to 18 months, brackets at least with a question mark, is my way of saying who knows and, and is based pro primarily on the wild speculations of people with more uh, information than me. A vaccine, of course, may, may not be possible. Um, what is more possible is the other two um, options out of this, which are either an incremental or a step change improvement in the way COVID-19 is treated or contained, which either reduces the rate of transmission or reduces the rate of fatality from the virus. Now, this is, of course, much easier, and there is extensive research material being produced every single day that is improving our healthcare practice treatment of COVID-19 is, is improving. The point about these second two more likely scenarios of improvements in treating and care is that they create challenges for us and, and for organisational leaders in, um, in predicting the impact on organisations and service deliveries. As lower, as lower rates of fatality occur, um, as I mentioned this a, a couple of times, that changes the cost benefit equation for Australia in terms of locking down. Um, the example I used before of the $1.1 trillion benefits from lockdown, if you reduce case fatality by 50% and you reduce predicted transmission by 50%, all of a sudden that cost benefit equation turns the other way and we're in the red rather than the black. Um, these scenarios um, create difficult decisions for government. Mounting economic costs and more limited benefits in terms of the um, uh, say, uh, lives, lives saved due, due to a uh, more treatable uh, illness. The key point to take away from this is, is my earlier one. Long periods of uncertainty and long periods of abnormal conditions are a feature of every possible way out of this um, 
way out of this crisis for us, as well as an ongoing need for the health system to have a capacity to respond to COVID-19. Our strong view is that for businesses to, for organisations like yours to thrive in this environment, you, we need resilient organisations, not business continuity plans. Business continuity plans have a time frame of weeks and months. They're designed for one-off events, bushfires, floods, etc. A crisis management approach um, has a cannot survive in a time frame of months or years. Now, all of us have rapidly changed the way we operate, but often with either consciously or unconsciously, a business continuity mindset, a focus on getting through this, getting our staff online, getting our access to our information, whatever it might mean. But this business continuity is focused on a one-off shock. It's focused on a, a, a bushfire, a short term. It's not designed for ongoing, dynamic, multiple crises. Business resilience is, is a, a phrase borrowed from the emergency services sector. Emergency services organisations have learned for a long time that each crisis in their world is followed by another crisis. Um, those organisations um, don't, ha uh, don't have business continuity through a crisis. Their resilience is one that thrives through a crisis environment and continues. Um, the difference between the two there is, on, is there on that diagram. And I might just draw your attention to some areas of focus of that different mindset of, around business resilience, particularly um, strategy, vision and leadership. Uh, with an attitude of, of get through. I'm sure many of you have put your strategic plans to one side, your, your strategies to a side because things have changed and rightly so. That's fine for a short period of time, but an organisation without a strategy of how you are going to survive and thrive for the next six to 12 months is a too long a period for your organisation to lack that kind of vision. Um, agile decision-making, um, we've seen many really wonderful innovations across public services. Um, I've used the phrase MacGyver innovations just to prove my child of the 80s status, but um, many workarounds, quick and, and effective innovations have been set up. Um, the challenge with a mindset of six to 12 months, um, the challenge of a mindset with uh, six to 12 months is making those innovations sustainable and, and, and prudent recognising in particular the risks that your organisation may be exposing itself to that may not become apparent in a period of short term weeks, but may become apparent over a period of months to years. And of course, workforce um, and maintaining strong workforce culture and development over an extended period of time. Excuse me. Perhaps one way to highlight this in particular is talking about innovation. One of the most important areas is how your organisation manages the innovations that you've already implemented. Uh, COVID-19 crisis has been dubbed the world's greatest, the world's largest remote working experience, uh, experiment rather, the world's largest remote working experiment. New ways of delivering services, of managing teams, of leading organisations have been stood up very quickly. Um, now some of those uh, to, the, to the diagram on the right uh, are great. Um, something like telehealth has had a really successful uptake. Um, the use of remote facilities in courts is something that's been long overdue and immensely positive. Others, of course, are, are painful workarounds that we can't wait to be, to be, um, to be rid of. Um, the left-hand side is my favourite meme of, of the COVID-19 crisis, which is just showing the true cause of some of these great uh, innovations that we've seen. But of course, there's this breadth of ambiguous changes, ambiguous in innovations, where the effectiveness of them is not known and won't be known without good, innovate, uh, good evaluation. Or well, likewise, areas where people or organisations are being exposed to risks that may not be offered, obvious in a short time frame. A mindset of ongoing uncertainty, this, this new normal for a period of months and years rather than weeks, makes it all the more important that we're moving from the MacGyver workarounds to more effective and sustainable innovation. Key points, Robin, you can then cut me off if there's a comment or question worth going to. So um, key points, sustained period of uncertainty and restrictions on your day-to-day -day, um, business is, is likely. Um, perhaps Australia is time for a new goal, uh, but for now, um, Australian governments have not committed to elimination. Locational outbreaks are, are expected and may possibly continue. Our view is a business resilience approach is, is needed. Business continuity plans are short term, and not enough to manage the long term. Um, and particular, uh, particularly encouraging a focus on innovation and, and evaluation scaling um, to prudently uh, adopt and continue those innovations that you've tried that are positive, but also be aware that, of the risks that you may be exposing yourself into the longer term. 
No, thanks, Tom. And yeah, look, there's been some questions coming through and uh, obviously uh, one of the questions that's come through is about, um, you know, why is the, the focus on, you know, a lot of the focus on sort of wave one as opposed to the, the other scenarios that, that we've articulated and, and maybe that, uh, that's, a, that's a good opportunity probably to segue into those other, the other waves. So I'm, I'm sure okay. people are keen to, to, to understand how they flow out, flow through. And there was another question that we'll try and deal with later. And that's about how do you transition your organisation from a BCP mindset to a, you know, a resilience mindset? What a, what a great question that we'll unlikely have time for. So why don't I, why don't I plow along? Um, the second wave we've got here uh, describes something that many of you may be turning your mind to now as, be, as you begin to recommence services that had to be suspended during the lockdown. Um, what I've got here is um, this gives a very partial list of what three months of lockdown means to just a few of Victoria's public services. These figures are estimates, um, but the scale is significant. Um, uh, for comparison, the NHS in the US in the UK has just recently announced that a 40% increase in its elective surgery wait lists, meaning that patients are going to wait something like three months, in an additional three months for procedures. And we don't have that data yet in relation to Victoria, but um, some of you on this call will no doubt know more than me about the extent of that backlog. These are just a few of the examples of what, of this, what the size of the backlog from three months means for Victoria. Um, these are high profile ones. These are public reported ones that I could find information on. But of course, wait lists are ubiquitous across health and, and social services, many of which have been facing demand pressures for, for many years. Um, and many of these backlogs, as per the list just here, are, are occurring in places that already experience high growth in demand and growing waiting lists. Um, this slide here is something that we um, is here to provide a warning about what the about what is the potentially destructive nature that overwhelming backlogs and demand can have. Um, this is a slide that we often use to communicate some of the pitfalls of the classic KPIs and measures of efficiency that we use across health and social services. I'm not going to spend any time on it because I suspect I'm preaching to the choir around um, uh, the risks and perverse uh, and destructive consequences that input-based and throughput measures and targets that are placed on health, health social services can and do and, and do have. Um, this slide is simply to communicate that classic efficiency targets, unit costs, output targets, they miss just about everything that actually manages to, that actually matters to the people that services work with. Our warning to you is that the, the backlog caused by COVID-19 will exacerbate these problems. They'll place great pressure on public services to meet targets and to produce backlogs. Um, and this provides a warning, not that you particularly need one, that with it, but without a view to um, outcomes and to people's end-to-end -end journey, it means a lot of effort focused on things that don't actually contribute to the outcomes people need. Um, so what are the ways in which backlogs are being managed effectively um, uh, that we've seen around, around public service environments? Um, firstly, make a plan to address your backlog and um, to address your problems of overwhelming demand. If you don't make one, um, one, will, uh, one will probably be made for you. Define your outcomes and priorities if you haven't already. Um, defining and measuring outcomes that you need to achieve and your priorities for your organisation during this backlog is key. Again, if you don't define them, no doubt your funders will define them for you. Prioritisation decisions are difficult, but they're necessary during this period. And we encourage you also to recognise uh, the flow, the end-to-end -end journey of clients and not and to avoid that focus on uh, input efficiency. Um, and finally, encouraging be, to being smart about technology. Um, uh, don't just to simply do the same thing, but online, take advantage of the opportunities that, um, that electronic mediums um, allow you to do things better. But similarly, make sure that your technology solutions aren't a wagon pulling the horse. Um, technology must suit the services you need to deliver, not the other way around. And of course, right now may not be the best time for a major technology investment. Um, so very simple key points there for us. The backlog is creating an unprecedented level of waiting lists that are occurring in some already very busy places. High levels of demand can indeed be self-perpetuating. Those issues around managing wait lists, responding to, um, to throughput targets can exacerbate the problems of getting people the outcomes they're actually seeking. And of course, prioritising very difficult. Um, so we're encouraging you to make a plan redefine what low or high value activities look like and have a sharp agreement on your values and your priorities during this period. I might play off the restaurant next one, Robin, you can cut me off if, um, if there's something to, to um, the reason I will be is the third wave um, flows out of that second, which is 
the longer term impacts we're seeing from that backlog. The fact that for many social services, Victoria has now had three months without many of the early intervention services or the ongoing treatment for complex health or wellbeing issues on which, which our, our management of demand relies. Uh, again, I don't probably don't need to prove to this room the value of early intervention. The matter is, or, or at least should be um, settled. This slide that you're seeing here is just one example taken from the um, child welfare space. Um, this is from work that was commissioned uh, done by Social Ventures Australia, commissioned by the Macquarie Foundation. And it just demonstrates the estimated reduction in the likelihood of a child entering out of home care or entered, er, entered, entering residential care that comes from implementing evidence-based early intervention pro, pro, um, programs. The benefits are huge. We know this, we know it's true for all parts of health and social services that the returns from early intervention um, are great. The COVID-19 crisis has meant a backward step in terms of early intervention. The maintenance of services has rightly focused on the most urgent interventions. And by definition, early intervention is not necessarily urgent, but it is critical to reducing long-term demand. Um, here's a few, um, we don't have great data, I think, on what has happened early intervention over the course of the crisis. Good data is likely to emerge over the next little while. Um, Victorian health data sets are being updated, um, haven't really been updated since February. So these stats are, uh, I guess, a grab bag of the reduction in non-crisis services in health and social services. Most are um, quotes, e expert uh, estimates rather than reliable data. But each of you know your own businesses better than I will, and you know more about the scale of this problem, and we will know more about the scale of this problem as time goes on. Early indications are that the reduction in ongoing treatment and early intervention has been significant. The size of the changes that I've quoted here um, uh, speak to that and they will have flow on impacts on the medium and longer term value, uh, volumes and complexity of demand. Um, these stats here on the screen are of course the macro picture. The micro picture is simply the impact of discontinuing and suspending services and, in, uh, and interventions over the past few months. A child at risk of disengaging, disengaging from school may have experienced three months of further disrupted learning. Um, people who participate in group programs will have them um, suspended. A family who's working with an early intervention service um, to care for the child in their care um, is likely to have experienced significant disrupted services over the time. Every one of those examples is likely to mean the situation has deteriorated from where it was prior to the crisis, increasing the levels and complexity of demand on your services. Um, it's worth probably acknowledging too at this point that even before the crisis, we weren't that great at investing in early intervention. This graph here is an excerpt from the Royal Commission into the Victoria's mental health system, highlighting the problem of the, mid, the missing middle, the absence of mid-level acuity services that work with people as issues arise, but before they escalate. This is a critical part of early intervention services. Um, of course, this little excerpt is about mental health, but it could just as easily have come from any number of social services reviews over the past, uh, past few years. Improving early intervention is a common focus in just about every reform going on in health and social services, family violence, the roadmap for reform, the statewide plan for Victoria's public health system, the Mental Health Royal Commission. It's also often a part of your strategic plans in, in, in many, many health services too. Each of these reform programs that are going on needs to be rethought in light of what we can and can't do in relation to COVID-19, but in our view, they must continue. If anything, the current crisis raises the need to invest more and re-entrade our systems more towards early intervention. So these reform programs have become more important, not less. Um, let me let me let me plough through, Rob, and then we can um, then we can pause for questions at the end. These are, these are just to summarise the key points from wave number three. Expect a growth in both demand and complexity of services because of our inability to intervene early over the last three months. Um, I didn't speak to this, but worth noting, early intervention is not just a service delivery priority, it's also a business management priority. Demand and complexity of your um, so, uh, is likely to grow, but other problems in your organisation around cultural performance, those, those, those issues that were already there, are also likely to have exacerbated over the, over the course of this crisis. A final point is that reform ambitions, in our view, are more important, not less, given this, in particular in relation to early intervention. The new government investment that I flagged earlier in the presentation is an opportunity to address some of those gaps in our service systems. 
And the final one, uh, the final um, wave that we're describing is um, the fallout of the, um, the uh, economic and social damage that I described earlier on. Um, we don't know yet, it's too soon to know precisely how great the impact of the crisis will be on Australian families and individuals. What we do know is this. Um, firstly, as I outlined earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has graduated from being a health crisis to a global disaster and a social economic crisis. We have strong evidence, uh, the second thing we know, we have strong evidence of the trauma that disasters impose on people's health and well-being. And we have evidence of the ex trauma experienced by people either isolating or being treated for COVID-19 or losing their jobs and businesses during the pan pandemic. And thirdly, we know that economic well-being, um, that is living and growing up in a home with a stable income, is one of the major predictors of just about every uh, factor of uh, a child's health and well-being in child protection, uh, uh, mental health, suicide, substance abuse, um, and physical health. Um, you may have seen the Brain and Mind Centre, for example, recently outlined modelling suggesting that we could see a 25 to 50% increase in suicides and a similar increase in related mental health from, people, from the toll that the crisis is taking on people. These numbers, if they prove true, would swamp the direct death toll from the uh, COVID-19. Um, early signs, as I said, there's not a lot of data yet, but the early signs are not good. A recent global survey in relation to family violence found that for women who, who are victims of family violence, more than 50% of them suggested that they were experiencing more financial controlling behaviours since the crisis. More, to, more than 40% of them suggested they'd, they were experiencing more forced isolation from family and friends and more physical violence as a result of the crisis. And 25% of them had experienced more instances of forced sexual contact contact after the crisis. Many of you may have seen reports from police and, and women's services um, that have the increasing in family violence reports beginning to increase as lockdowns are making accessing services more possible. Uh, to the key points for that uh, is the V-shaped recovery, which I discussed earlier. It, it, it is our hope, but it has never happened before. In reality, re recovery takes time and, and indeed some people never re recover in that sense. Social and uh, economic crises and social disasters take an enormous toll on people's health and well-being. This crisis is both of those things. It's both a social uh, disaster and an economic crisis and one on an extraordinary scale a long-term step change in demand for many health and wellbeing services to continue, is to, is to be expected. Um, the final point which I haven't really touched on is that every one of us has a role to play in minimising the long-term damage of COVID-19. The more quickly our organisations can adapt and to perform strongly to deliver great services and thrive and create resilient organisations for, for this environment, the quicker and, and the recovery effort will be for Victoria. Um, that's something I'm sure you're, each of you are eager to pursue and hopefully um, the conversation we had today provides you some food for thought in relation to that. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's, a, there's been a few questions filter through and, and maybe we can kick it off with some of the more recent ones, um, particularly picking up on your last point about early intervention and we're seeing a lot more visibility of the, the missing middle, certainly in terms of the the deliberations of the mental health um, system, Royal Commission into the Victoria's mental health system. I wonder, Tom, if you've got a, a view, you know, the, the the capacity, I suppose, for um, the system to be reorientated and and you know the appetite for government and the bureaucracy to, to to contemplate that sort of change. I know in some of the work that I'm doing with um, very much the health services um, at the moment, particular smaller health services in Victoria, is that there definitely is a, a much more of a focus in their strategic planning around early intervention and how they partner certainly with um, local governments. But I'm, I'm keen to understand your perspective, Tom, what you think the, the capacity and the likelihood that might be. Um, great, great question and great point of discussion that we could we could talk for a very long time. Maybe perhaps before I quickly answer that, I would just make, draw people's attention that I have gone two minutes over time. Um, perhaps I would just say, if you do need to take off, I apologise for running over time and we will stick around and answer as many questions as we can. But if you do need to take off, please, of course, of course do. And I hope, um, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Um, uh, my perspective probably just from, um, just from the role I've played within government and around is that um, particularly I pointed to that willingness from both stripes of government to invest. Um, that, that 
that funding, that investment is is new funding and and, and come brings with it an opportunity. I think particularly some of our acute um, end services are simply hitting capacity constraints, and in some ways those constraints have created an opportunity for us. Um, we simply uh, cannot create uh, more and more capacity even with with money. We do need to think differently about that. I wonder if particularly forums like this that that um, create more and more collaboration between particularly community services and health services provides opportunity for early intervention in ways that haven't um, maybe been fully realised before, uh, particularly around those, those uh, mid-level acuity needs. I know there are wonderful examples of um, specialist health practitioners being based within community services, providing earlier mental health support, those sorts of things. Um, uh, this new funding is absolutely, I think, an opportunity for that um, and probably something that we need to uh, that we'll be forced to take on because of the capacity constraints of the crisis end of the system. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, look, and I think um, a couple of the other questions that have filtered through the, the chat is, um, and probably going back to your um, um, comments about dealing with the, the backlog that we're facing and, you know, in some respects, a lot of organisations on board are probably swimming against the tide. Um, and we're mindful that you know there's, there's supports in place, but some of those supports are due to to finish soon. And I suppose we're all in this together. But how do we actually, I suppose, continue some of those supports or tweak some of those supports to to actually um, you know contribute to the solution? So we're not adding to the to the problem when some of those supports disappear. Do you have a view on that, Tom? Yeah, I, th I thought there's some really great comments from the Grattan Institute earlier in the week about. Um, the sort of cliff uh, around the end of JobKeeper, and, and you probably would have seen that theme in my um, earlier comments about the um, the state of unemployment. All of that, all of that number, all of those numbers are with JobKeeper still in place, and and the, the size of the reliance on that to to, to drop. Um, so I, I think um, Grattan probably said it better than not, than I did. The need to phase that out in a much more careful way is certainly something that's that's really really um, significant. I wonder for all of us though. I mean. Um, this, the breadth of this economic crisis and particularly the way it's hitting, hitting certain sectors like food and accommodation, it, it's also, I think, incumbent on us to reframe a bit our understanding of what at-risk families and vulnerable families look like. Um, this, this, the breadth and the scale and the speed of this economic shutdown is going to place people in economic uncertainties that aren't possibly the people that we tend to look, look to and to expect to be, um, to be vulnerable. There is opportunities that come from that. We all saw um, the Commonwealth Government increase um, the level of payment for, for job seekers, something that I'm sure many people on this call have been arguing for for a very long time and not getting uh, much progress. All of a sudden that became possible. Um, so possibly there are opportunities by seeing a, um, more of us in this difficult situation. But um, the, the stark reality of it is that um, uh, the breadth of people who will be experiencing economic vulnerability has has grown in a, in a really significant way and, and we're going to find vulnerability in areas that we hadn't looked for it before. I just want to say thank you Tom I know how much time both of you put into putting the presentation together so it would be what we needed. Um, I'm hoping we can we lure you back to do another one of these because um, look all of the chat that's coming through is great presentation really inspiring 